50% of India's population being under the age of 25, I think what's most important is that are these young students going to be educated? And not just India's 50%, but they are going to become the world's 47 million human resources in 2020. Whereas every country will have a shortfall of human resources in 2020. India is the only country that will have a surplus of 47 million human resources. Are we educating these young resources to face the challenges, the global challenges? Jobs will come to them or they will go to jobs. Are we getting them corporate ready? Are we getting them job ready? Are we getting them uh, are we making them young, uh, responsible citizens who will take up the challenges not only of India but also the challenges of the uh, and also take up the global challenges? Uh, looking at the role education is going to play, I think it's not just the formal education system that will be helping these millions to. Uh, get employability and to become educated but I think we will need to look at a lot of vocational education we will need to look at a lot of skilling uh, we will need to look at a lot of competency building for these young people and I think education will have to change its avatar of just formal education through colleges but we'll have to get online education will have to be available at their doorsteps, it will have to, as I call it, the McDonaldization of education, where they should just be able to go to a mall and pick up their skills so that they are able to equip themselves to face this world better. And how do you think teachers can adapt to this world? I think if you've seen a McKinsey report which says that the entire education system depends completely on the quality of instruction. So it's the teachers who make the difference. And I have to say that I remember that when uh, Dr. Radha Krishnan uh, was asked that what does he think about these new universities that are coming up, <coughs> he was saying that we forget that the best resources that we have are not the infrastructural resources, but just two, which is the students and the teachers. And I think the teachers can make all the difference. And I think now the teachers have to understand that their role has changed. No longer is a teacher a sage on the stage, but so much more a guide by the side. Today's young children have technology on their side. They can sit in a classroom and Google and tell you everything that you're teaching them. So how does a teacher become a facilitator? How does a teacher become a guide to say that use this technology to the best? How can children be better informed? How can children interact better with teachers? And what are the means the teachers can adopt in trying to bring all this across? As our education system grows, we are overwhelmed with numbers. If my teacher goes to a class, she has 120 students in a class. She doesn't know the face of a student, she doesn't know the name of a student, she just teaches the masses and comes out of the class. Is that teaching? How do we bring in that personalized interaction, that personalized coaching, the personalized mentoring? I think one of the ways we at HR College have thought of doing this is to introduce the KYC. The KYC is know your customer, but I would call it know your student. So we call it the KYS, and every teacher has to fill up a KYS on every student in the classroom. So that at least she knows the name of the student, so at least she knows what the student is about, and as you fill the KYS and as you start interacting with your students, you start building a rapport and you, I think the real teaching comes outside the classroom 
when the children actually can sit with you and interact with you. So I think a teacher's role has to be multidimensional. A lot of academic, but a lot more of mentoring and coaching. And this can be done through many ways. And I know that people hate it, the parents hate that their children have got the BBM, but I love it because my students are in touch with me. And I know exactly what is happening right now sitting here. There is a football match going on on my terrace. On the fourth floor, my students have just BBM to say that there's a film being shown as a part of the GEMS, which is one of the associations in the college. I knew before the site president entered my room that he's on the way. Now, I would not have all this if I didn't have the technology at hand. So I think a teacher must learn to use the technology to connect with these young people at their levels and understand what they enjoy. I think I'm using many more YouTubes now in the classroom than I did before because I feel that's the easiest and the fastest way to communicate an entire long boring lecture and in the 10 minutes I'm able to give them the entire gist and then we can sit and have a discussion. So I think this is what the role of the teacher is and uh, uh, it's very exciting times because we have very young, smart, uh, bubbling, dynamic students. I call them the butterfly generation which we have to see that gets focused as it leaves colleges and schools. And when what do you think about internationalization of education? Like more and more international institutes setting up this. I think today the world is a global village and it is a boundaryless, borderless world. Why should my students sitting here not pick up a program from MIT? Why should he not pick up a program from Harvard? Why should he not go online? This morning I got an email from somebody called Paul Siegel who sent me a mail saying get online and you will be able to pick up three courses on hospitality sitting at home and we'll send you the certification. Why not bring in internationalization? Why reinvent the wheel if somebody somewhere has done a great job? Why not do that? Also, I think internationalization brings you the sensitivity to what the different cultures in the world are doing. When you go to Japan, you see their culture, you know how to work with them, and then you, you understand and you're sensitive to this culture. It makes you a much fuller and holistic person when you understand the cultures of different worlds. So I think internationalization is a must. It should begin with student and faculty exchanges, joint research projects, and finally, if Howard can give a degree in Boston, why not a degree in India? So I am completely open to internationalization and I think we can build strengths, we can, we can do so much more. A student sitting in a village can, can actually get all the benefits that, that internationalization can bring, which just in his own country or her own country can't. For example, a young lady from my college, Vishaka Sarvaya, she went across and spent three uh, weeks in St. Catherine's College in Oxford. She's a daughter of a janitor. When else would she have got this benefit? Or how else would she have gone across and got this? Don't we all, we all wished to be a part of St. Catherine's College in Oxford. But she made it because of this international exchange program that we have. Ten of my students sitting here have got a Columbia diploma because Columbia has come forward to join hands with us. And imagine the amount of learning that the students have had, not so much from what Columbia offered, but in interacting with the ten Columbia students who came in and bringing in the diversity, the thinking, the culture, which has just opened up their minds. So let's not make it a, a very in, inward-looking India. Let's open up India to the, the great things that are happening all around the world. Let's bring the best to the country and let the best of the country be shared with the world. <laughs>